I got this. All right. All right, welcome. Thank you for coming to our session, OpenStack Troubleshooting. So easy, even your kids can do it. So hopefully when we get to the end, you'll help us validate whether that claim is true or not. So first, let's talk about who we are. I'm John Joswiak. I'm a cloud solutions architect at Red Hat. Um, I've been working with OpenStack since about Grizzly time frame. I was doing consulting for a few years, and so I, I'm really used to deploying OpenStack and seeing all the various ways it, it breaks. And my name is Vinny Valdez. I've been with Red Hat for almost 10 years now in various roles. I was also in consulting as a consulting architect for a number of years. Uh, John and I actually were part of a, a new team that was started about three years ago uh, to work with customers specifically around OpenStack to help understand what their needs were and help build out their environments and then ultimately go and deploy them, as well as train our, our consultants. So we've had a lot of experience in terms of seeing failed OpenStack, uh, not just on the deployment side, but on the operational side. I was also part of a 13 person community team, and we wrote the first version of the OpenStack Architecture Design Guide. Uh, and so now I'm, I'm in engineering. I've moved out of consulting. But um, I did present at the Tokyo Summit on the day in the life of an, architecture, uh, of an architect. And um, so hopefully we're going to bring our experiences um, to you guys and help you kind of go back and implement these in your environments. Um, now, there are a number of sessions that have been held on various troubleshooting. We've done our best not to duplicate that information at some of the previous summits. And um, we'll talk about kind of hopefully something new that we bring to the table. All right, so just in terms of agenda, we're going to talk through a bit about troubleshooting approach and some best practices to troubleshoot, um, and then focus more on how we can automate troubleshooting. Then we're going to look at two very specific use cases. Now, these are very common. Um, if you're at this session, you've probably encountered one of these. So you know, the kind of generic no host found, you know, what does that mean? How do I find out exactly what that means rather than just a no host found? Uh, and then instance connectivity, so specific to Neutron, a Neutron environment, you get the dreaded, you know, you assign a floating IP and you can't connect, you can't ping it, you can't SSH, and I'm sure that there have been different approaches to that, so we're going to look at that uh, very specifically and, and how we attempt to solve that problem. Okay, and, and, then, and then after that we'll walk through, after the manual deployment, we'll walk through and show how we demo automating that deployment or that fix. So as we said, we, we do think that Troubleshooting OpenStack is difficult, and we all know that. Um, now, this is a lofty goal. We don't know if toddlers are going to be troubleshooting OpenStack, but we do want to make it, or we think it should be easier. Um, so we're going to talk about some approaches and uh, a project that we've started and hope, hope that you guys will take that and use that in your environments. All right, so, so first off, before you even start troubleshooting, you know, don't be reactive. There's some things that you can, you can do in advance to make certain, uh, make certain you're more successful. So, you shouldn't have to wait for a user to call in. You should have some capability there to alert you of problems in the environment first. Um, in addition to that, you really want to know what a working system looks like. So if, if the first time you're hitting a problem, if, if you're the first time deploying OpenStack, it's a little bit more difficult, right? But, but if you're operating a cloud, you want to know what a working system looks like. You want a reference environment that you can say, well, here's what it looks like in the logs in this environment versus here's what it looks like in, in a failed environment. And also, you know, know what systems you're troubleshooting, know what logs you need to dig into. There's um, a former coworker who's no longer with our company who famously told a very big customer on the phone that OpenStack was just too difficult, there's too many logs, he, he didn't know where to get started. And he lost a lot of credibility at that point, but you know, there is some truth to the statement. There, there are a lot of logs, there are a lot of components, but know where you need to start searching. Don't, don't start panicking and just start dumping logs um, and, and understand what you need to look for. And, and then also try not to test a fix in production. If you can reproduce a problem in another environment, you would rather troubleshoot in that other environment before, before you know, testing your fix in production. If you do have to work directly in production, make certain if the fix doesn't work that you back it out because if you go through and do one fix, two fix, three fix, four fixes, eventually you don't know, you don't know how many things you've changed and you get lost in the environment. The other thing is, if you see problems occurring over and over, you, you really need to focus on addressing what the source of the problem is. And I, I've seen customers and other people write you know, ad hoc bash scripts and cron jobs to restart services because they keep failing. You know, it's not really a long-term fix and it's not really scalable. So you really under, want to understand what are causing these symptoms and, and how you need to address those. All right, so I talked about you know, being proactive and having something uh, alert you of the problem. If you've got availability monitoring, for a service being down, rather than me having to go troubleshoot why something's failing, like a Nova boot. If I know Nova computes down already, 
I'm, I'm already ahead of the problem before I'm starting troubleshooting, before I'm digging in on a system. You know, other things like um, RabbitMQ being connected, your API response times, and then just basic functionality. It, it makes a lot of sense to have an ongoing test that tests basic functionality, like a Nova boot. So you have a special monitoring tenant that just does a Nova boot every five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, half hour, an hour to validate that. That way you're comfortable that function works. You should never get called or it should limit the amount of times you're called from a customer saying, you know, Nova boot doesn't work. If, if that happens, you know it's something more specific because you've got a working functional test already. And then going back to, I mentioned logging. So central logging is extremely important. So you know, looking at things like your Elf stacks or Elk stacks or Splunk to help bring all of the logs together, especially if you have um, lots of compute nodes or even multiple clusters. You want to have a facility to be able to search for instance IDs or request IDs or specific error messages. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you can use things like Ansible, even just ad hoc commands, or um, as we'll demonstrate playbooks that will actually go out and bring those together uh, so you're not having to SSH into multiple systems to figure out what the problems are. And, and then also you want to have some sort of performance monitoring. You want to understand what your baseline performance is um, so that you can detect something that's abnormal. For example, if the CPU on your control plane is at 50% regularly, all of a sudden it's at 80% or 90%, you know there's something going on in that particular host to investigate. And the same thing is true on the compute side. You can, you can start to dig into problems that way. You also want to look for things like uh, RabbitMQ limits. If you hit a limit there, that's, that's somewhat difficult to troubleshoot in the logs and it takes some time. Um, whereas if you've got monitoring just to say, you know, I, I'm at my limit, that's just going to alert you and you're, you're going to know about it right away versus even having to dig into troubleshoot. And then something like MariaDB, especially if you're running that in a cluster and you're using Galera for synchronization, uh, you'll typically have HA proxy uh, to load balance across those. Uh, we had a, a very large customer who had some hardware that was very beefy. When, you know, we're talking uh, sizes that we hadn't seen before and the customer hadn't seen before. And so what ended up happening was we raised the database connection limit and that seemed to be fine, but there was an implicit connection limit at HA proxy that we hadn't thought about. And because the Python clients would spin up as many forks as possible based on the number of CPUs available on that hardware, it was actually dropping a lot of those, uh, those requests because the hardware was just too large at that point. Um, and then also uh, things like floating IPs. You want to keep track of how many floating IPs you have. You want to see some trending on when you're going to run out. So instead of a customer coming to you, they don't have any more floating IPs, you've already addressed that before it becomes a problem. Um, disk space on your back end is another great example where you can do that proactively versus having to dig into troubleshooting that specific problem. Um, and then, you know, you want to follow um, the idea, I think I mentioned it previously, you want to have a production-like environment to test all your changes. I, I consider it like a promote to production. When I'm testing new functionality in OpenStack, I like to use like an all-in-one or a small development deployment to really, to really validate the capability. Then before I push that to production, I want an environment that, that mirrors that. So it doesn't have to have you know, hundreds of compute nodes, but you want it to be the same architecture. So if production's HA, you want to test in an HA environment. You want it to be similar so that you can validate as much as you can before moving to production that you're not, you're not going to break something by having a different environment. And then something like Rally is very useful to benchmark your systems. Uh, that way if you introduce major changes or uh, even doing things like benchmarking your hardware and then benchmarking the instances on top of them and kind of understanding what your, v, your virtual tax would be, uh, so to say. Uh, and then using automation. So uh, that's something we're really going to focus on uh, once we get past kind of these general best practices that we're talking about. But uh, things like uh, Ansible, uh, and then, of course, Puppet and Chef. Um, but automating things using uh, you know, infrastructure as code and using Git to uh, store all of your changes. And then also along with that is making your changes as small as possible. You know, make sure that your commits are very sm as small as possible. They're related to the same sort of changes that you're making rather than big, sweeping, large commits that are difficult to undo or uh, really understand where, you know, where something went wrong. Yeah, and, and when troubleshooting, don't make multiple changes, right? Make one change, find out if that's fixed the problem or not. If it hasn't, back it out, then make your next change. Because like I said, if you go through and you change one, two, three, four different things in an environment, eventually you're not, you're not troubleshooting the same problem anymore because you've created three or four new problems. And then of course, some of the CLL clients have verbose flags, but the dash dash de debug are gonna be the most useful. Um, and especially when you look at the new uh, unified CLI client for OpenSec, um, you're able to manipulate the data a lot better, but you'll be able to see using debug, you'll be able to see the actual 
curl request that is uh, being sent to the API. Uh, and, and then lastly would be setting debug equals true in the various components. Now doing this, you know, we'll, we'll have to caution if you, I'm sure some of you have done that in here, but it will be very, very detailed. So it can fill up your logs. It can really be hard to pinpoint the information you're looking for. Uh, so one of the things that, that we'll show you a little bit later is we wrote a playbook to dynamically uh, turn on and turn off debug across your entire cluster as desired using an Ansible playbook. All right. Uh, so, you know, just a troubleshooting approach, obviously you want to narrow down the, the problem as much as possible up front. You know, if it's a, a Nova boot issue, you know, obviously you want to look at Nova. You want to understand the components that that could possibly touch, you know, Nova, your database, your, your RabbitMQ, um, obviously Glance, Neutron, but just understand what it could touch and what systems it could touch, because then instead of, you know, troubleshooting across 100 servers, you're troubleshooting across maybe four or five different servers. Um, and instead of every component, you've narrowed it down to a small subset of components. Um, and then you can also use something, um, you know, just starting with a basic check, you know, looking at OpenStack status, making certain your components are up. This is assuming you don't have monitoring there. At, at least then you can get a basic understanding of the environment quickly, or, or if it's HA, a PCS status. And then back to logs. We, you know, we mentioned that a lot, but that is where everything is going to be, especially if you turn on debug. Uh, so a lot of times, if you don't have central logging, you may want to start doing like a tail against various logs. And if, once you understand the, the workflow of a Nova request, for example, you'll understand that it touches a lot of components, you know, Keystone, Glance, Neutron, and Nova. So you have to tail a bunch of logs across a, a bunch of different services. Um, yeah, and then, and then, you know, if it was working previously, did a configuration change? I mean, some, some of the times uh, an environment breaks just because somebody's gone in, tested a config, it's changed. And if you have some tracking of that change, or if you have a, a tool like um, Puppet or Chef that you've used for the deployment, then you can at least confirm that that configuration remains the same. Um, and then you can use the install docs, obviously, to help troubleshoot, but I find it much better to have a reference environment. So if you've got a deployment that you know is working, you can look through those config files and compare. Since that's working, you, you know what good is. Um, and so if it breaks, sometimes the install guides aren't quite right. Um, but if you do find issues with the install guide, you know, submit bugs, submit fixes upstream. Yeah, that's the best way to do it. All right, so tools to aid in troubleshooting. Um, or, or trouble detection. So Browbeat is a solution that um, a Red Hat's performance engineering team um, built, and really it was around when they were doing performance troubleshooting and testing and finding bugs. Um, so there's, it's Ansible based, and, and what it can do is it can find some of the, the common bugs for deployments that aren't necessarily automated in a Red Hat solution, um, and, and at least then you're aware of those so you're not you know, facing a problem that's already been discovered before. And then Ansible. So we, we've mentioned that a few times. Uh, we, we like Ansible quite a bit. Uh, we're going to talk about what we've done with the playbooks in a little bit, but also ad hoc commands. So just running an Ansible ad hoc command to grab logs across your entire cluster for a specific request ID is a good, a good use case. But um, one of the things we, we find with Ansible is not just the usefulness of executing commands, but the playbooks themselves. If you write your tasks with good, useful, descriptive names, it could become a really good reference guide. So maybe you're not always running it, but you can kind of refer back to steps that worked at one point. So we like using kind of Ansible as, as, as it's a built-in documentation, documentation source as well. Yeah, and we mentioned Puppet and Chef already. If you, if you have those solutions, um, you know, anything to do configuration management, it avoids that config drift problem. You can make certain your configuration is a known working config. And then Triple O, uh, we have a product called Director based on that, uh, but it, it's a way to uh, manage your OpenStack environments that your end users use um, via a, a, an underlying OpenStack environment itself. So that's where the triple O comes from. It's OpenStack on OpenStack. Uh, but as part of that, we've written a lot of validation playbooks to help make sure that the environment is ready to have OpenStack installed, checking things like networking switches and your hardware itself. Yeah, and then Tempest and Rally are, are useful. Tempest more for functional validation. I think the problem I find myself with Tempest is it spits out a report and says, yeah, there's these hundreds of things it's checked and these 50 or so have failed. And I'm just like, you know, the system seems to be working fine to me. <laughs> um, so I find building your own functional validations is more useful um, because you know exactly what it's running. 
Um, and, and Rally is very useful if you can benchmark or baseline your system and get an idea of how hard you can push it before you deploy it into production. Then when you start to see performance issues later on, you know, is this within the range that I thought up front or is it, has, it, has it gone way beyond that? Um, the, other, the other part of that, um, Manage IQ, the upstream of, of cloud forms, is a useful tool because it can do a couple things with OpenStack. It has uh, capacity and utilization data, so you can see your, your host or hypervisor and the VMs that are running on that and get an idea of, of what that performance comparison is. Um, you can also do um, analysis of config files, so you can catch the configuration of the hosts and do a configuration drift analysis. So if you don't have Puppet or Chef running regularly, at least you can see when things have, when things have changed and what could be a potential problem. The other advantage of, of Manage IQ and Cloud Forms is uh, actually connecting to multiple OpenStack environments, and, as well as other virtualization and cloud environments, and, and give you this kind of single pane of glass to look across all of them. Uh, but lastly, not really part of automated troubleshooting, but when you're running into problems, obviously Google is your friend. Um, you know, Launchpad, you'll see bugs out there. Uh, that, or if you don't, maybe be sure to file those. But a lot of times I've, I've found things in patches that people submitted that I was able to implement in an environment for a customer uh, ahead of the, the fix being available within packages and so forth. And then of course IRC. So um, all of these different projects we talked about have IRC channels that you can go out and, um, and seek help on. All right, and then so what we've built is, is some playbooks to, to automate things. It's based on Ansible. We call it OpenStack Detective. Um, and, and really the advantage is when you're walking through a complex workflow, it's, it's much easier just to let automation do that. Just like it's easier to have automation configure your system, it's a lot easier to have automation walk through this troubleshooting. Um, and it's also faster. For me to walk through, for example, the Neutron troubleshooting that we're going to look at later, it, it's a lot of manual steps. It's a lot to remember. I, I have to look at my documentation on how I've checked it before because I'm not going to remember all of that. Um, Whereas if I run a playbook, it's like one line, and it can, it can detect that problem and, and show you the outputs that, that you, don't need to, you don't need to memorize all that stuff. And this is where we hope that your kids will be able to execute a playbook. It's a one-liner, they hit enter. Um, but there are some disadvantages to that. Uh, because these are very complex, first of all, developing these different, um, we, have, we call some things health checks, and we have other specific playbooks that we'll talk about. But they're very complex, so they're very time consuming to build but you have to understand the underlying workflows first to be able to do that. So if you come in and you just use these uh, playbooks, you use OpenStack Detective and you, you, you get some value out of it, that's great, but you may end up looking at it as a bit of a black box. You, know, you may depend on it a little bit more than understanding what the underlying troubleshooting methods are. So we're kind of, uh, kind of acknowledging that that might be a bit of a disadvantage. Um, and we've also noticed as we've been testing and creating these different playbooks that there are some configurations between some of the older versions of OpenStack, like Liberty and, and uh, Kilo and so forth, that have changed in Newton. So very specifically things like the Keystone Auth variables. Like for example, instead of referring to um, admin underscore user, it's now just username. Um, and so unfortunately, a lot of our scripting and playbooks have broken. So that may happen to you guys you may, if you have things that depend on specific versions. Um, so we've had to do a lot of work around detecting versions and doing different things based on, on what version we're running. Yeah, so I just have this on my local GitHub right now. Obviously, if there's, if there's a lot of interest in that, we would look at moving this into a, a formal project. Um, but we've just left it there for now. OK, um, so John's going to walk through one of the use cases. Uh, this is the basic no host found. And he's going to talk about what it takes to do this manually. So this is kind of understand, understanding the workflow and the underlying reasons behind it. And then we'll look at automating it later. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so just looking in terms of the request flow, this is a, a, a very old diagram. I wanted to use OS Profiler to walk through this and, and refresh this to make certain it's, it's all valid. Um, you see quantum still listed here. Um, but this is basically what a request flow looks like. It's about 28 steps. It's, it's a lot of potential pieces that could break in there. Um, realistically, there's, there's probably a, a handful less that you'd actually have to look at. Um, if you want, I've got the source on the slide here if you want to dig into that. Um, but basically, just know, you know, I mentioned up front, know what's involved in a process. You can see all the components that are involved in the process. So you have an idea of if, if my boots failed, it, it could be Nova, it could be Glance, it could be Neutron, it could be Cinder. There's, there's, there's a handful of things there that you'd really need to look at and potentially troubleshoot. Um, so no host found, and, and Nova Scheduler in itself. The, the way Nova does scheduling is it has a number of filters. And so if you start out with 10 hypervisors, it runs through each of the filters you have defined in your environment. And at the end, that's its list of available hosts that could, that could provision that instance. And then it will choose from one of those hosts. Um, 
So there is good documentation online for all the filters. It basically explains all the possibilities. Um, and you don't have to use all the filters. You, you could disable filters if you don't want a particular filter to run. Um, but just looking at the, the list I have here, retry filter is basically saying if a hypervisor's failed, um, I'm not going to retry that hypervisor. I'm going to rule it out. Availability zone filter to ensure your hypervisors are in your availability zone. A RAM filter to make certain that you have that you have RAM, a compute filter to make certain the compute nodes actually enabled and active, um, and, and down the line. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so, um, so basically, for the test, we just picked uh, we just picked an, an instance um, that was too big for our environment to boot to easily to easily show a failure. Right. Um, one of the things that would be really cool to do with Ansible is to build enough, a lot of failure scenarios and walk through and, and use that for training. You know, make a number of ways to break a system and execute it, maybe on random, and, and then have to go in and fix the problem or analyze the problem based on that. Um, we didn't have that much time, but it would be a really neat thing to do. Um, so first thing, when, you're, when you do a Nova boot, you don't, you don't actually see an error. It just says build is what's responded back to you. If you do a Nova list, then you'll see you know, whether it's been successful or not, what, what status it's in. So, uh, uh, a Nova list, for example, if, if no host is found, it will come back pretty quickly and, and change to a state of error. Um, interestingly, if, if there's no hypervisors available and you do a Nova boot, it will just hang on build scheduling for quite a long time. It won't actually come back in error at all. So if you ever see build scheduling hanging out there, it, it probably hasn't found a, found a hypervisor. Um, so do a Nova show on the instance, and you can get some detail back um, about the instance. Um, it shows a, a small blurb about the error itself. Um, in this case, something like what's here in Nova Conductor, right? It, it shows no valid host was found. There are not enough available hosts. And, and what that means is it's gone through all of its filters, and it's returned zero hosts. Um, but it doesn't show you an easy error just from Nova show. Um, but in the logs, of course, you know the data is there. So if you, if you look in the in the Nova scheduler log, um, you'll you'll find a more detailed answer. So in this case, the RAM filter returns zero hosts, and so you, you know at that point what what filter has failed. Um, so that's kind of where you'd have to start your troubleshooting. So if it was you know an availability zone filter, you know you probably have no hypervisors specific to that availability zone. In this case, we know we just don't have the right amount of RAM. Um, and so to troubleshoot this, uh, of course, for a core filter, you know, looking at the number of cores available or uh, a RAM filter, you, you just look at the, at the hypervisor um, or look at the hypervisors themselves. So hypervisor stats can show you um, the amount of overall capacity for your environment. But I, I might have, you know, 64 gig of RAM available, but if I only have one gig per hypervisor, that's not, that's not going to be worthwhile. Um, so this OpenStack hypervisor list, it's the cleanest way I could see to just to just output me the, the total and what's used for each, um, for each individual hypervisor. Um, and then, of course, there's overcommit capabilities, right? So um, in general, if you're not changing any of the configuration, um, CPU allocation is 16 times overcommitted. I, I wouldn't suggest running there because um, things aren't going to perform very well. Um, but if you look at 16 to 1, it means that for every CPU you have, you can, you can run 16 virtual cores assuming that you've got your core filter running. Same thing with RAM. At 1.5 to 1, it means that you could run one and a half times your memory, keeping in mind that you have reserved memory that's kind of taken as overhead. Um, and, and so when you're looking at what's available, keep, keep these overcommit ratios in mind as well. Um, so I, I think I mentioned these filters already previously, um, just ensuring you have an operational host, making certain you have an availability zone and a retry filter. Um, just saying it's going to not try the same hypervisor that's already failed. Um, and, and a couple more unique ones. The compute capabilities filter it is working off of um, what's actually defined in your flavor. So if you have a, a special property in the flavor, it's looking for um, hosts that match that separate that special property. If it, if it doesn't find a match, it, it's going to fail with, with no hosts returned. Um, so you, you know from seeing that failure on that filter what to start to look at. Um, same thing on the, on the image properties side. If your image properties, um, um, if your image properties are looking for a specific property, um, if that's not set um, on a hypervisor, if there's no hypervisor available that can fit that, that, that would fail too. Um, so that's just a, a brief walkthrough of, of you know, basic no-host found um, 
analysis. Uh, we're going to move on to, um, Vinny's going to talk about troubleshooting instance connectivity. So again, not very kid friendly, right, but very important background information that we need to know. And so this is going to be a little bit of the same here. So I hope everybody has a coffee or something because this is going to be a little bit into the weeds first and then we'll talk about how to make it easy. But um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to go through a scenario that probably everybody has been through. We provision an instance, we assign a floating IP, and then I can't ping it. I can't SSH. What do I do? Now, I'm assuming that this is not a provider network environment. This is kind of a, a, you know, a tenant network or a project network uh, environment. Um, so you want to go through the normal workflow. Have I assigned a floating IP? Because this is not automatic with Neutron. Um, with Nova Network, there was an option to make that automatic, and this is not. Um, is there a router available in the project? Is it pingable? Is it, is it up? Um, can I connect over the network namespace? Uh, is that functioning properly? And can I ping the instance? Uh, look at in the Neutron logs, as we've talked about. So once we've kind of validated all that, then you can go to the instance itself, go to the console, log in, check the networking stack. Is there an IP? Uh, if there is, you know, what paths out can you ping and so forth. So once you have gotten to that point, and let's say, assuming you don't have a network stack, the DHCP was not able to obtain an IP address, that's the scenario we're going to be going through. Um, now you have to go kind of fall back to understanding the packet flow, and that's what we're going to do is we're going to walk through that um, and look at what it takes to troubleshoot each interface along the path between the compute node and the network no host itself. So this is a diagram that's been out for a while. Um, it's on RDO. Uh, if anybody's seen this before, there's a very detailed explanation for each of these steps. We're not going to go through that right now. Uh, I just want to kind of give you a high-level uh, diagram. But we're basically going to be starting uh, at the very top where we have these test instances. That's where we're going to assume our instance is. But there's a tap interface. That's what uh, A represents there, which connects to a, a bridge where IP tables is implemented for now. I believe that's changing in the future. Um, that then connects to a BR int. Uh, which then connects to the BR ton, which then connects uh, to the VXLAN overlay network, which then goes over to the networking host and then goes up the stack. And in our example, we're going to be going into the DHCP namespace. We're going to try and troubleshoot that error. And now, of course, if you're going outside, you're going to be then hitting the router instead. But uh, let's, let's kind of walk through what that would take. So uh, I, I quickly went through this. We're going to hit the tap device first. We'll hit what's called QBR. Now, Q is a holdover from quantum. Um, this is the quantum bridge where uh, uh, IP tables is implemented. Then we have QBR, uh, sorry, QVB, which is the v one side of the VETH pair, which is connected to the bridge. Then the other side of that VETH pair is a QVO, which is then connected to the um, open V switch side. That then connects into BR int. Then there's patch ton, patch int. And so you can see this is, is pretty complex here. Uh, then it connects to the um, BR ton, which is where the VXLAN overlay encapsulation occurs. We move over to the, the Neutron uh, network side and essentially roughly the reverse steps. So we start with BR ton, we then we move on to patch int, patch ton, BR int, and then I have listed Q router here, but we're actually going to be going into the uh, Q DHCP namespace. So a bit of a nasty workflow. <laughs> <laughs> so what we want to do is, is understand what the general troubleshooting steps are. So we want to connect to the console. Uh, as I said, we're going to generate some DHCP traffic that is constant so that we know that we're generating uh, DHCP discoveries. Uh, if you want to, you could actually boot into gpixie. So you can restart your instance and hit, I believe, Control-B, um, which will give you a prompt. And you can type auto boot, which will generate some DHCP traffic outside of your OS if you think there's an OS type of issue. Uh, but in our case, we're going to go in and, and just do that at the OS level. Next, you want to determine which hypervisor uh, compute host that instance is running on. Um, as we said earlier, you don't want to just kind of randomly um, start looking at compute nodes. You need to understand the one that's having the problem. Then we'll start inspecting the interfaces and go through the uh, different interfaces that I mentioned. And then we'll move on to the compute, uh, I'm sorry, the network host and try and figure out where the problem might be. Okay, so in this example, I've connected to the console. I've started the uh, DHCP client in a continuous mode and I'm just generating DHCP discoveries. And typically I would have gotten a response, but in, in this case, you see I have not. Next, I want to find out where the uh, instance is hosted. So I've showed two different commands here. You can use the old Nova list or the OpenStack server list. And throughout the rest of the slides, I try to show both commands where, where applicable. Um, there are some things that are not always possible in the new OpenStack uh, unified CLI just yet. But in my case, I've, I've found out where that hypervisor is. Uh, next, I want to find out what port that instance is connected to. 
So this is one command here that you can't, there, there isn't an exact equivalent under OpenStack port, uh, port list. So here I'm doing a neutron port list and I'm passing the ID of the instance itself. And that's gonna return the port uh, ID itself. So you see the, uh, I've got it bolded there, A7E. Well, what happens is those first 10 characters, so the first eight, the dash, and then the, the additional two characters are gonna be used throughout the rest of the, uh, the workflow in creating interfaces. And we'll see that here. If you do an IPA and you, you grep for a tap, QBR, QVB, and QVO, you'll see that they're all, the, the, whatever the interface is, and then the first 10 digits of the port ID of the instance. And so you should see those on the compute node. And remembering that order of interfaces that we get hit, now we want to start TCB dumping those. Um, so I'm just doing a TCB dump on the, starting with the tap interface, and I'm looking for DHCP traffic, so port 67, port 68. And this is what I hope to see. Uh, well, if it's working, I would also see a reply. But in this case, I'm seeing my discovers. And so I see those correctly. So let's move on to the next interface. Now on, I'm on the QBR. I see my DHCP traffic, so it seems to be working fine. So let's move on to the uh, QVB interface. I see my traffic there, so we can keep going. Now QVO, continuing to see my traffic, so that's good. And now uh, in a later or a newer version, so I've seen this in Newton, I, I haven't been able to go back and see exactly where this was introduced, but there's a VXLAN SIS 4789 interface um, that is also used, so I can TCB dump that as well. And you'll notice that I haven't actually TCB dumped BRINT, BRTUN, because those can't be monitored directly. You have to set up a, a, a mirror uh, and a snoop device if you want to do that. But um, I could actually, uh, in this case, I'm just going to TCB dump the actual physical interface. So I still see my traffic, so everything seems to be good so far. Lastly, uh, I could use OVS OFCTL, which will dump my flow tables. And the reason I do that is if you look at the packets over there towards the right, uh, if you run this with watch, like I have suggested here, those packets should be increasing. So you should see that there are packets flowing um, through this um, Neutron workflow. So now I'm gonna move over to the network host and I'm gonna start repeating the same command, starting with dumping my flows. I should see my packets increasing. Uh, I can move up to the physical interface on the Neutron side. I still see my traffic. Now I'm gonna move up to the VXLAN interface. Traffic's still there. So at this point, it, everything seems to be connected properly. So what I wanna do is I wanna move into the DHCP namespace. So if you do an IP net and S, you'll see a QDHCP namespace, you should. And usually in a, in a larger environment, you'll have multiple. I've just, uh, for brevity, I've only listed the one here. But don't just take it for granted that that's the right one. So you wanna make sure that that is the one uh, DHCP interface for the network that your instance is on. So there's a few ways to do that. Here I'm showing a port list, and I'm listing the DHCP by the dash dash device owner uh, parameter, and that should match up. I, I could then do a show on that, and I should see that the network ID, and that's what I, I've called out that column there, should match uh, what's listed on that QDHCP. So you see it's B89, same as what we see at the bottom. Uh, you could also just do a, a Neutron net list, and it should be the one that's assigned to that uh, project. A quick time check. We have seven minutes. Thanks. Uh, okay, so now uh, I want to get. I want to take a look at that namespace. So I'm going to do an IP net and S exec against that namespace, and you'll see that I um, I commented out or I omitted the LO the loopback stuff, but I have a tap device here starting with 7063, which should match the port ID of that DHCP namespace, and that's what I'm doing here at the bottom. <coughs> Neutron port list. Bless you and we see that everything matches up. And you can see the IP address at the bottom, 192.168.200.3, it matches what's inside that namespace. So everything seems to be working properly. So um, we can now TCP dump inside that network namespace. Uh, if you notice, I'm using a dash L parameter to TCP dump. If you don't do that within the namespace, you won't actually see your output until you stop TCP dump, then it, dump, it buffers it. Um, but this will let me see. So I'm in the namespace, I'm in the DHCP namespace. I see my requests, my, my DHCP discovers, and so we know that everything seems to be plumbed properly. So uh, now this is a, a use case example. We probably should have looked at this first, <laughs> but if we look at a neutron port uh, agent list, we see that it's actually down. So I can uh, use a PS, I see that it's not running. I'm restarting it with OpenStack service. Now it's running and I should get my IP. So not so kid friendly, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, so we're going to show how we've automated this. So from a demo perspective, we're going to show the instance connectivity steps he's walked through. We're going to show a more general health check. Um, we're going to show the fix to that instance issue, and then walk through my no host example. We should have a... OK, so this is going to be walking through what I mentioned. I have a couple of instances. I'm going to grab the floating IP. And we can try and connect to it. So I'll start out with a simple ping. Now I know this network works. I know that everything else should work in this environment, but I'm not getting the connectivity. So now I'm going to drop back to the manual steps that you uh, saw me implement. So first I want to grab the ID of the instance. We're going to use that in the Ansible playbook. Then I'm going to connect to the console. And I just want to make sure that the things are as I think they are. So I want to log in and look at the networking stack. Now, this is a little bit more difficult to automate. So this is kind of just, we don't need to do this part. This is just for demonstration purposes. But once I become root, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about why I had to do that in a little bit. But I don't have an IP address. So that's a problem. So I can try and bring the interface up. And it's going to send out some discovers. There's not going to be a response. Now, I know that this will uh, time out after a while. So what I'll do in this case is I'm going to cancel this, and I'm going to bring up the DHCP client manually, and I'm going to tell it to infinitely send out discovers. And that will guarantee that I'm generating the traffic I need, and then I can go back and uh, trace the different interfaces. Now, instead of walking you through everything that I went through in those 20 slides or so, uh, we're going to execute one of the playbooks that we've provided for, by uh, OpenStack Detective. So I've already created my host file, which is just my compute nodes and my controller. So I'm going to call this playbook with one parameter, which is the instance ID. Since I copied that, I already have that in my buffer. And I'm running it with dash V just to get a little bit more information. And since this takes a while, I'm going to fast forward. But um, I did want to show you, if you start looking, you see some of the D TCP dump output. And we start with the compute node. We fast forward a little bit. Now we're on the network node. Uh, we're looking in the namespace here, right here. And then we should be, see the TCP dump in the namespace. There we go. And it's done. And so part of that, it, it produces this report. So we can see all of the packets for the compute node. We can scroll down. And then there should be all the packets for the network host. So this is just one example of that entire workflow that I went through is now completely available to be fully automated for your environment. Yeah, now the health check is, is a little bit different than that. So instead of troubleshooting a specific issue, it's just taking a look at the entire environment and, and saying, is the environment healthy? So we're looking for things like, is the MariaDB databases up? Can they be connected to? Are things like the Keystone endpoints set up correctly? Are the, are the um, user and password set up properly within those? Um, and so any problems there, you know, services as well, those should be called out. So we have an issue with a glance here, but you see right away it can call out that the DHCP agent's not, not available. It's, it's not running. So that gives an option to, to be able to troubleshoot or quickly review an environment for problems, maybe rather than having to go into the troubleshooting at all. And then here, I'm just going to connect to the controller, um, which happens to also be the network host, and just correct that issue. So we should see that the agent is down, as I mentioned. So we're just going to bounce that, verify that it's up. And then now we switch over to the instance, and it instantly got an IP. Well, it, it got a response. Um, this is uh, the, uh, the, we're using Cirrus at this point, so I'm not exactly sure why it, it didn't work as intended, but bringing the interface uh, down and then back up uh, solves that issue. And now I should be able to connect to it, ping it, SSH, and so forth. And so just an another way, as we mentioned, to automate some of the standard workflows. Of course, you can modify these. Uh, we welcome any contributions um, and additional playbooks and so forth. Now we'll go through one more. Um, this is going to cover the no host found, um, and John's going to go through that as soon as this is done. All right. And Cubs win. They, they might. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just verifying that the uh, address matches what we saw. So we SSH'd in. All right. And, and then the no host found is, is very similar in approach. We've got a playbook that's going to check specifically for, for that host. So we've gone through. We, we've done a boot of an instance um, that doesn't fit on our hypervisor. Um, we do the Nova list, and we see that it's in error state with power state of, of no state. 
so we can go in and, and do the Nova show specifically for that. Um, just, just to see the same errors as, we, as, we, as we've shown previously, to give an idea of, of what the high level problem is. Um, if we scroll up, we see no valid host was found, but, but no data as to why we got that. Um, so rather than um, digging through all the logs, um, we can run a playbook to, to do that analysis for us. Um, and it's just a, a Nova trace logs. And what this is going to do is it will go to all the hosts, pull all the log data specific to that instance ID, um, and then it will report that back to you. So you could see from, from top to bottom, um, or chronologically, all of the instance actions that have taken place. Um, so this is just executing right now. Um, and if we go look at the instance log. This can produce a couple of logs. That's right, yep. So, so the first log is just that, that sorted log showing you know, top to bottom. Here's everything in the log for that specific instance. Um, so you could look through here and find the, find the error itself, but we've also done some analysis against that. Um, specific to no host found, that can give you a much, a much clearer answer right there. That In this case, it's a disk filter that failed because we didn't have enough, enough disk space. So it, it's, not, it's not solving all the problems, and there's a lot of capability that we need to build here. Um, but certainly, if we built that up, it would give us a capability. So instead of having to, you know, be a, a expert at OpenStack, you know, the community finds these issues, and if we build a playbook when we find it, eventually troubleshooting is pretty easy because everybody's seen a lot of this stuff already. So that that's uh, everything we had to present about. We just want to remind you: if you have access to a time machine, we have several presentations Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday, um, but later today there are some additional sessions. Um, so thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, yes, there's a microphone right there. Feel free. Which one's your order? Are the slides available online? They will be. Uh, traditionally, they're always available at least within a week or two. I, I don't know exactly uh, when that would be, but yes. How, how to get to that information? You have some... Page, web page set up where you put the link. We should have provided our information, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will tweet out where the slides are. Um, so I go by at Vinny Valdez, V-I-N-N-Y. Um, I'll tweet out to everybody about this session. But um, I believe they should be available via the app or, or, uh, or some method. Okay. And your name is on the uh, announcement? Or yes. Yeah. Vinny, like my cousin. <laughs> Hi, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Yes. And I just wanted to share, um, um, you skipped the OVS TCP dumping, right? And uh, recently I found uh, a script, a Python script, it's called OVS TCP dump, and it makes it very easy to, to just use TCP dump on OVS uh, ports. And very I wanted good. To share it. Thank you very much. Yeah. That would have saved lots of time. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the summit.